Hey there, stats enthusiasts. Welcome back to our AP Statistics series on Unit 7, Inference for Quantitative Data Means. I'm Goldie, and I'm going to be taking you through Notes 5 today, which is significance test for a difference in means. So we're going to run another significance test now for a difference in means. It's going to be a great lesson today. So go ahead, sit back, relax, and let's dive into the content together. Let's talk about our setup for a significance test for a difference in means. First, by talking about the conditions. Now, these conditions are the same conditions we needed for our confidence intervals for a difference in means. So it's going to be a bit of a review here. Um, remember, for random sample, um, if we're randomly sampling, we need two random samples or we need a random assignment to two groups in an experiment. Um, for the independence condition, we only have to check when we are sampling and we do have to check the 10% condition on both of our samples. In an experiment, when we're not sampling, we do not have to check this. And in fact, you will get points taken off if you check it. So please make sure that you are careful about that. And then for our nearly normal slash large sample, um, there's a few different ways we can meet this condition. We either can be told that both populations are normally distributed or approximately normally distributed, um, that both sample sizes um, are larger than 30, then we can invoke the CLT. Um, but if one or both are smaller than 30, we do have to graph our sample data and check to make sure there's no outliers or strong skewness there. So those are our conditions, the same ones we just went over for a competence interval for a, a difference in means. But now we're gonna talk about how to perform a two sample t test for population means. Now there is a two sample z test, um, and remember that's reserved for when we know our population standard deviations, which we rarely know. So I'm not gonna go through how to perform that because we've already kind of talked about for talked about it for a one sample. We're going to focus just on the two sample t-test since that is what we usually encounter when we need to run this inference procedure. So when those conditions are met and your null hypothesis is a statement of no difference, right? One population mean equals another population mean. Um, we are going to find our t-test statistic by finding the difference between our two statistics, sample statistics. Usually here we would subtract our... Um, our null hypothesis, which in this case would be zero, okay? When you have them set up as mu1 equal to mu2, um, that means that there is no difference or the difference between them is zero. You might also see this written um, as mu sub one minus mu sub two equals zero, okay? You can just do a little algebra there and see how that's true. Um, but that is another way to write the null as well as the alternative hypotheses. Um, but I keep it like this. Um, most people, um, including the AP Stat CED, keep it like this. Um, so you're going to have your subtraction of your statistics. Usually it's minus your parameter value, which is zero. So it's not written here in the formula. And then we divide by our standard error. We find the p-value then by calculating the probability of getting this test statistic um, this large or larger in the direction of the alternative. So I say this large or larger, but it's um, probably more appropriately described as this extreme or more extreme. Um, we use the t-distribution with degrees of freedom. Um, remember, we can do degrees of freedom two ways. We can do the smaller degrees of freedom based on the sample sizes we have, or we can report the degrees of freedom given by technology. We're gonna go over that technology bit in note six. So that's gonna be coming up here. Um, the problem we are going to do today, we are just going to be doing it by hand and we're gonna use the smaller of the degrees of freedom for those sample sizes. And then, so you get a picture of it. These are all our alternative hypotheses and how we can set them up. Um, we can suspect that the first group is going to be larger than the second group, that they're just not going to be equal to each other, or that the second group is larger than the first group. Okay. We have done um, a significance test, um, a lot of them actually by now. So we're going to jump into this example and use this new information about the difference in means and apply it to what we know already about significance tests. So here's our, here's our example. 
Okay. Um, the question is, does increasing the amount of calcium on our diet reduce blood pressure? So we're going to examine a large sample of people um, who revealed this relationship. Okay. And the relationship was strongest they found for black men. And because this was an observational study, when they looked at this relationship, we can't quite draw that cause and effect conclusion, right? So we designed a randomized experiment with 21 healthy black men who volunteered to take part in this. They were randomly assigned to two groups. 10 received a calcium supplement for 12 weeks and the control group received a placebo pill for 12 weeks. The response variable is the decrease in the systolic blood pressure for a subject after 12 weeks. An increase appears as a negative number. Okay, so that means they looked at um, before minus after when they measured the response. So they took the person's um, before blood pressure, the t which is the top number, the systolic one, um, and then the after. So if their before was less than the after, it ends up being a negative number. Okay. But what we would like to see with the calcium supplement is that the before was larger than the after. Okay. Cause that would imply that the calcium helped decrease blood pressure if that number was positive. Okay. So that's what we're, that's what we're looking at here. And that's going to be important when we set up our hypotheses, but here's our data. So we're given the two groups. So remember when you see a table like this, um, you have to decide, you know, am I doing a two sample T test or am I doing a matched pairs test? And it's all about how you set up this experiment. Okay. 10 received the calcium supplement and 11 received the placebo. And because they were randomly assigned to each group, there's no relationship between the pairs here. Okay, right? There's no relationship between the group one and placebo. This is not the same subject. And because of that, we are not doing a matched pairs procedure. We are going to be doing a two sample T test because we have two separate groups. Okay. So our question is, do the data provide convincing evidence that the calcium supplement reduces blood pressure more than that placebo? Okay. So remember, if the calcium supplement reduces blood pressure more than the placebo, we want to see the calcium group have a larger mean than the placebo group. That means they had a larger mean reduction. And that can help, you can help understand that by first defining your parameters, right? So calcium is the mean decrease in systolic blood pressure for the calcium group. And mu sub p is the mean decrease in systolic blood pressure for the placebo group. So I'm going to use c and p here um, to help differentiate between all of my variables here. So when we're talking about the decrease, we want the decrease to be larger for the calcium group than the placebo group. So when we set up our hypotheses, our null is always the statement of no difference, and our alternative is going to be checking to see if that mean decrease is larger in the calcium group than the placebo group. And that's why our alternative is gonna be mu sub C greater than mu sub P. And then you'll also notice I wrote the significance level off to the side too. Okay. Next, we wanna check our conditions. Subjects were randomly assigned to the treatment groups. That's good. Um, we don't have to check independence because we are conducting an experiment. Um, and because both of our sample sizes are less than 30, we are gonna graph the sample data here. So I have both graphs up here. Um, graphs of the data show no outliers or strong skewness. Um, so we can proceed with our T calculations here. We can assume that the data came from a normal or approximately normal distribution. Now to get these graphs, uh, remember you can put your data into L1 and L2 and just create a histogram on your calculator. Make sure to adjust the intervals so that you are able to do an appropriate rough sketch, um, but then you can rough sketch it out and comment on the outliers and skewness here. Okay. Name your test. Okay. So I'm going to be running a two sample t-test for means. So we always want to name our inference procedure. 
And because the data is already in my calculator, I can go ahead and get my summary statistics here. So for the calcium group, I run um, my one bar stats on my calcium group, which was in list one, and I get my mean standard deviation and my sample size for my calcium group. I'm gonna do the same thing for my placebo group, um, mean standard deviation and my sample size for my placebo group. Now that I have all that information, I am able to create a t-statistic from it. So I didn't write down the formula again because I already named the test via words, but you can write down that skeleton formula for the t-test statistic if you would like. But I took my um, calcium and I subtracted my placebo. So that's why it ends up being a positive because it's five minus a negative 0.27 and that's gonna be in our numerator. And then in our denominator, we have our standard error, which is going to be the calcium standard deviation squared divided by 10, and then add it to the placebo standard deviation squared divided by 11. And I'm gonna get my T test statistic of 1.603. Now, degrees of freedom, I am gonna be doing this by hand, so I'm gonna use the smaller degrees of freedom between these two groups. Okay, if I subtract one here, subtract one here, I get nine and 10. The smaller one is nine, so I'm gonna say degrees of freedom is nine, okay? And then I get my p-value. Remember, I got my p-value, you still do TCDF. My lower boundary is gonna be that 1.603, um, and then my upper boundary is positive infinity, and my degrees of freedom are nine. My alternative is greater than, so that's why this is my lower boundary, and this is my upper boundary, and this is my degrees of freedom. That's gonna report my, my p-value of 0 0.0717. Once we have our p-value, we of course want to make a statistical conclusion and then our conclusion in context. So we would say because our p-value of 0 0.0717 is greater than our significance level, we fail to reject the null hypotheses. So that's our statistical conclusion. Our conclusion in context then, we would say we do not have convincing evidence that a calcium supplement reduces blood pressure more than a placebo. And then our, um, our question also wanted us to interpret the p-value we got in the context of this experiment. So we would say if calcium had no effect on blood pressure, the probability we get a difference of 5.27 or larger is 7.17%. Um, now, you don't necessarily have to report this number. Um, this was the difference between um, the two... Uh, the two groups, okay, so that's how we got 5.27, um, but you could just not report that number. I just wanted to kind of be thorough and say that we could, we could throw that in there as our interpretation with our p-value. And that wraps up our video on notes five, significance test for a difference in means. Our next and last video in the series is gonna be note six, where I go over calculator commands on the TI-84 um, and how we use those commands to perform the inference procedures we've learned about in this unit. And then I'm also gonna talk about how we choose our inference method when we're faced with a problem. How do we choose which one, because we have a lot of them now, how do we choose which one we are going to perform? And that's gonna be the last video in our series. So go ahead and skip ahead if you are ready to tackle that. As always, if you have liked this video, please click the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great AP statistics content. I wish you endless statistical success and I will see you in the next video.